Hello everyone, this is Yashveen from Exam Web. In this video, I'll be solving paper 4 variant 1, May June 2022, 0625, Cambridge IGCSE Physics. Question 1. A car of mass M is traveling along a straight horizontal road at a constant speed V. At time t is equal to 0, the driver of the car sees an obstruction in the road ahead of the car and applies the brakes. The car does not begin to decelerate at time t is equal to 0. A. Explain what's meant by deceleration. So deceleration is negative acceleration or change in velocity when or rate of change of velocity when the velocity decreases. B. Suggest one reason why the car does not begin to decelerate at t is equal to 0. So t is equal to 0 is the time when the driver sees the obstruction and he takes some time to react to this obstruction so this would be the reaction time which means that he will begin to decelerate after seeing the obstruction c figure 1.1 is the distance time graph for the car from t is equal to zero so as you can see over here we were mentioned in it was mentioned in the question the car travels at constant speed and it does not decelerate at t is equal to zero which means for some time after t is equal to zero the velocity of the car will be constant and that's shown by the constant gradient for some time after t is equal to zero so let me just label that here constant speed is represented by a constant gradient and as the graph starts to curve during this region this means the car will decelerate or the gradient is changing and again gradient of a distance time graph is equal to velocity here the gradient is decreasing so the velocity is also decreasing one state the property of a distance time graph that corresponds to speed again that would be the gradient because speed is equal to distance over time and the gradient of the graph would be y-axis which is the distance divided by the x-axis which is the time to use figure 1.1 to determine the initial speed of the car so initial speed of the car can be determined using the gradient of the the initial gradient of the graph for as long as it remains constant. So I will be using this particular coordinate over here which is 0 0.5 seconds and and this distance is 11 meters. So my speed would be 11 divided by 0 0.5, which is equal to 22 meters per second. D, when the car is decelerating, there is a constant resistive force on the car due to the brakes. Let me just draw this car. Here we've got the car and there is going to be a resistive force which acts in the opposite direction to the motion of the car which let's say is to the right hand side. The deceleration of the car is greater than F divided by M which is the mass of the car and it's not constant. Explain why the deceleration of the car is greater than F divided by M. Alright, so according to Newton's second law, the resultant force, so F net, is equal to mass into acceleration. So acceleration would be the resultant force divided by M. Now in this case, the deceleration acts in the opposite direction. However, there is this force is not the only force which acts on the car also decelerates due to air resistance which again uh, acts in the opposite direction to the motion so i'll label th this as f a and so the total resistance and so the total force or the resultant force would be f plus f a meaning that a would be equal to f 
which is given in the question due to the bricks plus fa which is the air resistance divided by the mass as you can see over here the numerator is greater which means acceleration will be a greater value we need to add the air resistance force due to air resistance to the numerator two the deceleration is not constant as the deceleration begins the car will slow down and resistive forces have this property that uh, it depends on the speed of the moving body if the speed of the car is decreasing the resistive force would also decrease and as you can see over here acceleration is proportional to acceleration is proportional to the resistive force if this will decrease then acceleration or deceleration in this case would also decrease Two, figure 2.1 shows water stored in a reservoir behind a hydroelectric dam. A state the form of energy stored in the water in the reservoir that is used to generate electricity. Electricity is generated over here using the form of energy that's already stored in the water. And in this case, it is gravitational potential energy in the reservoir as it's shown in the diagram. Water is stored at a height of 150 meters from the turbine b the turbine is 150 meters below the level of the water in reservoir the atmospheric pressure is one times 10 to the power of 5 pascals and the density of water is a thousand kg per meter cube one calculate the total pressure in the water at the turbine so they mean to ask the value of pressure over here this pressure would be the sum of atmospheric pressure which is acting over here as well as the pressure due to 150 meters of the column of water so total pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure plus pressure due to water right and hydrostatic pressure as we know is equal to density multiplied by gravity and height of that fluid which would be a thousand multiplied by 10 multiplied by the height of water which is 150 you would add this to the atmospheric pressure which is one times 10 to the power of 5 pascals and this leads to the pressure of 1.6 times 10 to the power of 6 pascals so the turbine has a cross-sectional area of 3.5 meters squared. Calculate the force exerted on the turbine by the water. So the formula which uses the formula of force which uses area would be pressure is equal to force upon area, which means force is equal to pressure multiplied by area. Area of uh, cross-sectional area of turbine is 3.5 meters squared as given in the question and pressure is the value that we just calculated in the previous part so this would be equal to 1.6 times 10 to the power of 6 multiplied by 3.5 and that's equal to 5.6 times 10 to the power of 6 newtons see the water flows to the turbine through a pipe of constant cross-sectional area and here they mean to provide you with some information constant cross-sectional area explain why the kinetic energy of the water in the pipe remains constant as it flows through the pipe so kinetic energy is equal to half into mass into speed squared if kinetic energy is constant that means mass and velocity or speed both have to, to remain constant so for one mark, you'd mention how the speed remains constant. But how would you know the mass remains constant? The formula of mass is density multiplied by the volume. Density remains constant. And as mentioned over here in the question, the cross-sectional area remains constant. So volume is equal to cross-sectional area multiplied by length, which means as a result, volume also remains constant, which is why at the end, kinetic energy would remain constant.
these are the two factors which maintain the kinetic energy at a constant value. Question 3. During a picnic on a warm, dry day, a metal can of laminate is wrapped in a damp cloth. Evaporation cools the water in the cloth. A. Explain in terms of molecules how evaporation cools the water in the cloth. So, evaporation is the process which will convert uh, liquid droplets into vapor and in process it also lowers the temperature and you're supposed to describe how that happens over here so again evaporation occurs when liquid molecules turn into vapor in this process higher energetic molecules will be able to escape the surface the surface being the water clock over here because these molecules will have enough energy to break the bonds that hold them to the other molecules as a result of this, when higher energetic molecules have escaped, they leave behind only lower energetic or less energetic molecules of water in the water cloth over here. And this also means that average kinetic energy of the remaining water molecules would decrease. Kinetic energy and temperature are proportional, which means as the kinetic energy of remaining molecules decreases, the temperature also decreases. So here you've got the three points that higher energetic molecules escape would be the first point and the energetic and less energetic molecules of water remain would be the second point. The average kinetic energy decreases would be the third point. B. As the water in the cloth cools, so does the laminate. Explain how electron transfer thermal energy through the metal of the can. Here I'd like to draw the structure of metals or a metallic structure where you'll have positive ions. These are basically atoms that have lost electrons and then you'd have delocalized electrons that have come out of the atoms. So the way electron transfer, the way heat transfer works in a metallic structure is the ions in the metal would vibrate so these ones they would vibrate and then they'd hit the delocalized electrons this will move electrons throughout the metals when they'll have energy to move and as the delocalized electrons travel through the metallic structure they'll transfer the energy that they carry on to other metallic ions throughout the structure by passing the heat onto distant ions For a thermocouple is a device that's used as a thermometer. A. Figure 4.1 shows a beaker that contains molten sulfur at an initial temperature greater than 400 degrees Celsius. One on figure 4.1, sketch and label a diagram of a thermocouple that's used to determine the temperature of sulfur as it cools to room temperature. So the way a thermocouple thermometer works is it's made up of two wires that are connected at both of their ends to form two different junctions. One of them would be placed at a temperature of known value which would be cooler. Uh, so that could be for example 0 degrees Celsius which is the melting temperature of water. The other one could be placed at the hotter temperature which is to be found out and these wires are connected to a voltmeter which will give an EMF value and this EMF value would be used to determine the temperature at hotter end and the two junctions of the wires are at different temperatures it will produce an emf which is uh, essentially what the voltmeter detects so let's say for example here we've got another beaker which will contain a mixture of ice and water and this will be around zero degrees celsius and then you've got a thermocouple thermometer that's connected to a voltmeter and don't forget the two wires now these two wires are going to be made of uh, different metals so this could be an iron wire and the other one would be let's say copper 
here you've got the voltmeter don't forget to label your diagram to describe briefly how the temperature of the sulfur in the beaker is deduced so you will use the emf value that's measured using the voltmeter and along with the thermocouple thermometer comes a calibration graph or calibration table. So if you know the value of EMF, you can use that to find out the value of temperature. For example, let's say you had a calibration graph where you will have plotted EMF against the temperature. So if you know the value of EMF, you'd be able to find the corresponding value of temperature as well. You only need to know one to find out the other value. B state one advantage of using a thermocouple thermometer to measure temperature rather than using a liquid in glass thermometer. So the highest temperature value of a liquid in glass thermometer is lower than the highest value of temperature which you can measure using thermocouple thermometer and thermocouple thermometer also gives a more rapid response you can write either one for the one mark in this question five figure 5.1 shows a kitchen tap that supplies instant boiling water cold water passes over an electric immersion heater inside the tap the way an electric immersion heater works is it's got a heating element or a metallic heating element which is going to be immersed in water and this will surround the and this will heat the surrounding water the boiling point of water is 100 degrees celsius state what's meant by a boiling point this is the exact temperature at which liquid turns to gas the process of boiling b the immersion heater is powered by the mains at a voltage of 230 volts when the tap is open, the heater switches on and the current in the heater is 13 ampere. 1. Calculate the thermal energy produced by the heater in 60 seconds. The formula of energy which will use voltage, current and time is VIT. So here you've got 230 multiplied by 13 and 60 which will be equal to 179. 179,400 joules will round it off to two significant figures which would be 1.8 times 10 to the power of 5 joules to the specific heat capacity of water is 4200 joules per kg degree celsius the cold water that enters the tap is at 22 degrees celsius so this is going to be the initial temperature When you have been given the value of specific heat capacity, this could mean that you might need to use the formula of specific heat capacity, which is equal to energy divided by mass into the change in temperature. Let's see what we already know. The energy which is transferred to the water is, as we found out in the previous question, 179,400 joules. Specific heat capacity is 4200 joules per kg degree Celsius. Mass is unknown. And let's see what we can find about the change in temperature. Calculate the rate at which water at its boiling point emerges from the tap. So boiling water emerges at its boiling point, which means the final temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. Using this, we can find out the change in temperature, which is final temperature minus the initial temperature or the temperature at which water enters the tap this would be equal to 78 degrees celsius so now we also know 70 the change in temperature using this we can find out the mass but what does that have to do with calculating the rate at which water emerges from the tap the rate at which water emerges from the tap would be equal to the amount of emerging water from the tap divided by the time taken for the water to emerge. The amount of water could be the mass. And since we will we'll be finding out the mass of water, which is heated during 60 seconds, that means the time taken would be 60 seconds. And so this mass, again, we'll re rearrange the formula of specific heat capacity 
would be equal to energy divided by specific heat capacity multiplied by the change in temperature which is again 179,400 divided by 4200 multiplied by 78 and then you will divide this by 60 to find out the rate which will be equal to 9.1 times 10 to the power of negative 3 kg per second and I say kg per second because you divide the mass by time again the time taken is 60 because this is the time taken to transfer this amount of energy for this amount of change in temperature see the metal tap is earth and there is a fuse in the cable that connects the heater to the mains. One explain how the earth wire protects the user. So there are going to be three wires, the live wire, the neutral wire and the earth wire. If the life, if the life cable touches the metal tap, the current will flow to the earth and not into the person. So the person would not be electrocuted because of uh, the metal tap being earth, which is a safety measure and part 2 ex asks you to explain how the fuse protects the circuit so if the current in the wire exceeds the rating of the fuse which is going to be the ideal current which you want in the circuit if the current exceeds that the fuse will melt uh, the circuit will break and current would not flow anymore which is how it will protect the circuit Six figure 6.1 shows a road next to the sea. A. On a sunny day, the sun warms the road. Describe how energy from the sun reaches the earth and warms the road. So there are three methods of energy transfer. There are conduction, convection and radiation. Conduction and convection both require a medium, whereas radiation does not. And that's how energy is transferred from the sun down to the road. Because for energy to travel from the sun to the earth, which is where the road is, it has to pass through the space, which is vacuum. And radiation will allow the energy to do that. Right. So light energy would be transferred from the sun to the earth as it travels through the vacuum in space by radiation. And then it will be absorbed by the road, which is how it will get heated up. B. The temperature of the road is greater than the temperature of the sea. The surface of the road is black suggests one reason why the temperature of the road is greater than that of the sea. Black color of the road makes it a good absorber of radiation, so it's better at absorbing the heat than the sea. C. The air above the road is heated by the warm road. Describe how this affects the molecules of the air. So you've got the road and the air above this would be heated up by the heat of the road you're asked to describe how this will affect the molecules of the air so we will need to answer in terms of the molecules of air when air molecules gain kinetic energy which is basically what heat is doing it's providing kinetic energy to air molecules they'll move faster and they'll move farther apart this is according to Charles' law, which states that the volume of a gas at constant pressure is proportional to its temperature. So as kinetic energy increases, or as the temperature increases, the kinetic energy increases, and so the volume of gas would increase. In terms of molecules, this will mean that they gain kinetic energy, they move further apart, and that's how the, they are affected. So first, the temperature of gas increases, remember as I said earlier, the temperature and kinetic energy are proportional. When temperature increases, kinetic energy increases, and kinetic energy is equal to half into m into v squared. This will mean that their speed will increase, so they move faster, 
and because of Charles's law, their volume would increase, so they will move further apart. Two, a cyclist traveling along the road notices that a cool breeze is blowing from the sea to the land. Explain how convection produces this breeze. You may include a diagram if it helps your answer. Convection is a method of energy transfer in fluids by convection currents. As fluids heat up, they'll rise up because their density decreases. And cooler fluids would sink down due to their higher density. And that's how convection current works. That the same thing is going to be happening over here. The air above the road would get heated up, so it would rise up due to lower density. And the air above a sea would be cooled com in comparison to the air above the road. And so it would sink down due to its higher density. Then this air would blow and replace the air above the road. And then the cycle is going to repeat. So we mentioned in the previous question that the molecules of air above the road would move further apart. In other words, their volume would increase, which means their density would decrease. And so I'll start my answer using that. When volume of air above the road increases, its density decreases. And so air rises up and cooler air from above the sea will replace the air above road. Question 7. Figure 7.1 is a full scale diagram of a small nail N in front of a thin converging lens. The line L represents the lens. The focal length of the lens is 3 cm. Let's get familiar with a few terms over here. So a converging lens is a lens which brings together or converges rays of light. Focal length is the distance between the center of the lens and the point where all rays would converge. And so the point where all rays converge would be the principal focus. Line XY is the principal axis. So this line over here is the principal axis. Part A, rays of light parallel to XY are traveling towards the lens. Describe what happens to light after it passes through the lens. So first off, the lens would refract the light. All right, let's look at the rays of light that are parallel to xy. xy is again the principal axis and any light which travels parallel to uh, the principal axis, which is the line xy over here, it will get uh, converged at the principal focus. So these lines will also intersect at the principal focus. Let's say we had a few parallel lines traveling to the lens they would travel they would get refracted and they would all meet at a certain point which would be the principal focus b on figure 7.1 mark and label with an f each of the two principal focuses of the lens so one of them would be in front and the other one would be behind the lens as given in the question the focal length is three centimeters so each principal focus would be 3 centimeters from the lens. That means, uh, okay, this is 1 centimeter every box. So, 3 centimeters would be this distance. I'll mark the principal focus over here. And the other one would be 3 boxes behind the lens. So, now you've got the two principal focus. C, the small n of height 1.2 cm is positioned 2 cm to the left of the lens. By drawing on figure 7.1, find the position of the image I of the nail N and add the letter capital I to the diagram. Okay, so the nail is placed between the lens and the principal focus. Whenever this happens, 
a virtual image is formed. So here you will need to draw two rays of light. The first one would be parallel to the principal axis and then it would get refracted but it has to pass through the principal focus on the right hand side. So I'd use a ruler to ensure that. And then the second line which you draw would pass from the top of the object and through the center of the lens. And because it's passing through the center of the lens, it would pass straight through and not get refracted. Now you will need to draw dashed lines to continue this line which passes through the center. And then you will also need to draw a dashed line to continue this uh, the first ray which we drew but you will connect it to the right side of the ray not the one on the left side of the lens the point where the two dashed rays converge is the point where the image is formed and as you can see this forms on the left hand side of the lens which is the same side at which the object is placed which means that the image would be virtual and you would label that capital I. To state and explain whether I is a real or a virtual image. Again this is a virtual image as the rays of the light do not meet. So these lines which we have drawn over here are not real. They do not actually meet which over here which is why the image is virtual. Three state the name of uh, state the name given to a lens when it's used in this way that would be a magnifying glass. Question 8, figure 8.1 shows two vertical cylindrical tubes and a cylindrical magnet all held in a vacuum. One tube is made of plastic and the other one's made of copper. The two cylindrical tubes have identical dimensions and they are the same length and diameters. The magnetic field of the small cylindrical magnet is extremely small. Initially, the magnet is at rest at the top of the plastic tube. The magnet is then released as it falls through the plastic tube without experiencing a resistive force. The magnet takes 0.67 seconds to fall to the lower end of the plastic tube. The mass of the magnet is 0.012 kg. Calculate the kinetic energy of the magnet when it reaches the lower end of the plastic tube. Kinetic energy again is equal to half mv squared where mass is given. The speed of the magnet when it falls is not given we need to find that out but we are given that initially the magnet is at rest which means the initial speed of the magnet is zero it takes 0.67 seconds to fall and the acceleration due to gravity is 10 and we need to find out v so you can use the formula v is equal to u plus a t which means v is equal to zero plus 10 multiplied by 0 0.67 which is 6.7 meters per second and so kinetic energy would be equal to half into 0 0.012 multiplied by 6.7 squared and that is 0 0.27 joules b the magnet is then held at the top of the copper tube and released as it falls through the copper tube an electric current is generated one explain why there is a current in the copper this happens because of electromagnetic induction which means that an emf is induced in a conductor when either the conductor moves in a magnetic field or the conductor is stationary in a changing magnetic field uh, in this case the conductor is stationary which is the copper tube and the magnet and the as the magnet falls the conductor will cut through the magnetic field lines of the magnet and in turn EMF is induced in the copper 
and this will lead to a an induced current part 2 the current in the copper produces a magnetic field of its own in the tube and we learn this with the magnetic effects of a current that there is a magnetic field around any conductor which carries current the magnet falls much more slowly in the copper tube than the plastic tube explain why the magnet falls more slowly in the copper tube in this part, Lenz's law will be applied, which states that induced EMF opposes the change that causes it. In this question, as induced EMF in the copper leads to the current, and therefore induced EMF leads to the magnetic field in the copper, the magnetic field of the copper will oppose the magnetic field of the magnet, which is going to fall. Let's say this is the magnet, and this is the copper. This could be because of the fact that, well, this will be because the magnetic fields of the two objects will repel. Say that could mean North Pole and North Pole are facing or South Pole and South Pole are facing. Or just li uh, like poles of the two magnetic fields face each other, which will create a repulsive force and that will act upwards. It will push the magnet upwards. But because the magnetic because the magnet will have a weight or the force which acts downwards and this weight of the magnet will be greater than the force that's created because of uh, Lenz's law the magnet will continue to fall although it would take longer than it would have taken while uh, falling over the plastic rod so here we'll talk about how induced EMF in uh, copper will oppose the change which produces it which is the magnet falling through the copper rod and this will result in an upward force on the magnet again due to interaction of the magnetic fields of the copper rod and the magnet Question 9. Combinations of logic gates are used when digital signals are processed. A. Describe the difference between a digital signal and an analog signal. You may include diagram, a diagram if it helps your answer. A digital signal consists only of ones and zeros, whereas an analog signal has values that change continuously. B. Figure 9.1 is the truth table for a logic gate X. State the name of logic gate X and draw a symbol that represents it. This truth table is the opposite of the truth table of an OR gate, which means that logic gate X is a NOR gate. And here is the symbol for it. C. Logic gate Y is identical to logic gate X. Draw a combination of logic gates X and Y that behaves like an OR gate. Label the inputs A and B and the output Q. So you've got two NOR gates which you need to use to uh, make, a, make an OR gate. And this is how you'll connect them. You will connect the output of the first NOR gate to both of the inputs of the second NOR gate and let me show you how that works by copying the table given in the question so here you've got input a and b and here's going to be the output q let's say we've got the same inputs 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 and 1 here the output would be 1 0 0 and 0 right and that means uh, the output signal would be the same as both of the input signals for the second NOR gate so when the output is 1 the second input would also be 1 and so on 
Now, because this is a NOR gate, both when both of these signals are one, the output would be zero. When both of the inputs are zero, it would be one, one, and one. So this is your output Q. And now, as you can see, you have got the inputs and the output, which is the same as you would find for an out for an OR gate. Two zeros gives zero, zero one gives one, one zero gives one, and one one also gives one. So now you've converted two NOR gates into an OR gate. Question 10. Two of the isotopes of hydrogen are hydrogen 2 and hydrogen 3. A1 state one similarity in the composition of their nuclei. Their nuclei have the same number of protons. As isotopes are atoms of the same elements with the same number of protons and electrons, but different number of neutrons. Here we won't mention electrons as they're only asking about the composition of nuclei. To describe how a nucleus of hydrogen 3 differs from a nucleus of hydrogen 2. Hydrogen, both of them have the same number of protons and hydrogen 3 has 3 minus 1 which is 2 neutrons and hydrogen 2 has only 1 neutron. So they differ in terms of the number of neutrons. B in a nuclear fusion reactor, a nucleus of hydrogen 2 fuses with a nucleus of hydrogen 3 at an extremely high temperature. This fusion reaction produces an isotope of element X and releases a neutron. One, explain why an extremely high temperature is needed when forcing these two nuclei together. Fusion reaction combines two nuclei that have like charges, and like charges repel. To overcome this repulsive force, the reacting nuclei need to have high kinetic energies and that will be your answer over here the kinetic energy is provided by the high temperature to using nucleide notation complete the equation for this reaction so we know that an element x is going to form along with a neutron neutron has proton number zero and in place of mass number in place of mass number you'd write one in a nuclear notation mass number and proton number are conserved the total number or the total mass number over here is five which means you need to write four over here to conserve that and proton number is two since the neutron has none this would be two and this is it we are done with this paper thank you for watching